So we're starting our All In series. And uh, the Spirit of the Lord has been here in a beautiful way all day long. And I'm excited about this series. We're, we're going to talk about where we are as a church. We're going to talk about where we're going as a church. And we're going to use Scripture to guide us. But I believe it's also going to help us as individuals. It's going to help us as families. It's going to help us as businessmen and women. It's going to help us as educators, as grandparents. It's going to help us, most of all, as Christ followers. And so as we launch this, this series, the idea of being all in means that, that we're putting everything out there. We're putting all on the line. We're, we're saying, God, if you don't come through, this is bigger than me. This is bigger than what I can do all on my own. But it is saying, I'm going to bring everything that I have to the table. I'm going all in. And there, there's moments to go all in with our family and, and with our friends. There's, there's moments in faith to go all in. To, and there's some things that you're just never going to reach. There's some places you can never go unless you're all in. When we talk about the promises of God in our lives, we talk about the promised land. When we talk about the promised land, it required being all in. I want to enter the promised land. I don't want to just enter it, though. I want to make it home. I want to live in the promised land. See, God's given promises to his people. He's given promises through scripture. And he's given promises through personal relationship. In scripture, in fact, the minister and author Herbert Lockyer listed over 8,000 biblical promises. Many of them can be applied to the New Testament believer. Now, I've taught from here and for many years that not every promise in the Scripture can be applied directly to every individual in the world, even every believer today, every New Testament believer. But those that can be applied should be applied. Why leave the promise on the table if it's something that you can reach out and grab and bring into your own life if God's given it to you? So I think we have to understand the context of the promise within Scripture. And then others of us in the room, maybe, maybe you have a relationship with God such that, that you know you have a promise with Him by relationship. In that in a time of prayer or study or devotion, suddenly you felt just impressed in the Holy Spirit. You felt impressed in your heart that, that God had really given you a promise about your family or about your friends or about your work or your job or your company or your employees or whatever it may be, a relationship in your life. And you know that God's given you a promise about that thing. Maybe he didn't say, you know, in a particular book of the Bible, chapter this and, and verse that, uh, hey, Bob, you're going to be living in 2019 and this is what's going to be going on in your life. Maybe it's not quite that clear in Scripture. But in your relationship, you know that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about this and given you a promise. Now, let me tell you what you can know for sure about this promise. If it is a promise of God, it will align with Scripture. If it does not align with Scripture, it is not a promise from God. It could be wishful thinking. It could be hopefulness. It could be all kinds of things. But unless it aligns with Scripture, it cannot be a promise from God. But if it aligns with Scripture... And my encouragement is to hold on to it, pray into it, and believe God to bring it to pass. Today, what we're going to talk about is what it takes to enter the promises of God and make them home. And our scripture today is Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says that Joshua, God spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and he said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan into the land I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you. This is a big promise. This is, this is a, a promise from God to Joshua that had been given to Moses and in fact had even been given to Abraham many years before. And now Joshua's job is to lead the people of God into the promised land. And here's, here's the big idea today. And if you're a note taker in your service guide, there's an opportunity to take some notes. And I always encourage you to do so. The big idea today is this. God is all in with his people and requires that we be all in with him. 
When God gave this promise to Abram, many years ago in our, in our uh, knowledge of it, it's Genesis chapter 12, but Abram didn't know he was living in Genesis chapter 12 when God started speaking to him. And so here he is in, in our understanding, Genesis 12, and, and God's giving him this promise, but some things happen in Abram's life. Some things occur in his life and in his children's life where it looked like maybe this promise was not going to come to pass, but God was already all in on this promise. It was going to come to pass. And then God renewed that promise with every consecutive generation. And now he had promised it to Moses and he's reminding Joshua, you're part of this process too. Now we're using an Old Testament example to bring an understanding to New Testament believers. I'm thankful that I'm a New Testament believer today. How about you? So we're New Testament believers looking at an Old Testament example. And why would we do that? Isn't that Old Testament and we are New Testament? Why would we look at an Old Testament example as New Testament believers? And I would say that we were doing that because the Apostle Paul encourages us to do exactly that. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 11, he says, these things happen to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So Paul is writing to the church there in Corinth and he's saying, listen, our forefathers made some decisions that had some negative repercussions and, and we know about it. It was written down, it was recorded for us so that we could be warned against doing the same thing. There are examples for us. And so he's saying to the New Testament believer, because Paul is writing to the New Testament church. He is a New Testament believer. And he's saying, hey, use the, those that have come before us in faith as examples, their lives as examples of what we need to be doing in our life today. It's right for a New Testament believer to use the lives and situations of the Old Testament as examples. But when we launch into this, we have to understand what, the, what we mean by promised land. Because many of us have grown up knowing and understanding or hearing that the promised land is all about heaven. That we're going to go to heaven someday and it's going to be awesome. That's the promise. And I thank God that we are as believers. We are promised that heaven will be our home. But when we're talking about applying the, the crossing of the Jordan River into the, the land of Canaan, which is the promised land to the nation of Israel, when we're talking about that, we cannot be talking about heaven. We cannot be talking about heaven because when Israel crossed over the Jordan River, they had battles to fight. They had to take the city of Jericho. They had to take the city of Ai and so on and so on. There were battles to fight. They had to kick the Canaanites, those people who were already living in the land. They had to move them out. And, and here's, here's the reality about heaven. We're not going to get to heaven and have to kick a bunch of people out in order to live there. <laughs> now you may get to heaven and see some folks and go, wow, I'm shocked they're here. <laughs> but you can't kick them out. That's done. So it cannot be that the move into Canaan's land for Israel is the equivalent of us moving into heaven from earth. So what is moving into Canaan's land? What's the equivalent? It's stepping into this place of salvation. When we are saved, we're crossing the Jordan in salvation. The promised land is living in alignment with the will, plan, and direction of God in your life. How many people are thankful that you're saved today? You know that you're saved. Praise God. Now, how many people that are saved know that they have fought a battle since they've been saved. There's been one or two small little insignificant battles that you have had to overcome even though you're saved. Well, there are battles to fight. There are territories to take. There are goals to be accomplished in salvation. And so when we're talking about the promised land, we're talking about salvation. The difference is this. Walking into the promised land means victory is guaranteed. 
So if you are saved today and you are walking in salvation, there is no chance that you will lose the battle unless you stop fighting. It's the only way for you to lose. So you continue to press forward in the power of the Holy Spirit and you will, I will win, praise God. That's his promise. So I have three thoughts for us today. And thought number one is this, that God's plan and purpose for his people did not change. His plan and purpose for his people did not change. God said to Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people across the Jordan River into the land that I'm giving them. So God's plan and purpose had been laid out for Moses. Years had passed. They had come to the Jordan River the first time. Moses said, hey, it's time to go across. And, and the people of Israel said, no. And now 40 years later, God's calling again. The promise and the plan had not shifted. The situation was different. The faces were different. The time was different. But the plan and the purpose remained constant. In your life, if God has given you a promise in your life, that plan and that purpose has not shifted. It may look different than you thought it was going to. It might be uh, becoming reality in a different time than you thought it would. The faces that are involved may be completely different, but the plan and the purpose has not changed at all. And as Joshua is thinking about this, he could have gotten really excited and said, all right, all right, God, I'm going to swim the Jordan right now. The next verse could say, and Joshua raced to the Jordan, swam across the river, and he took Canaan all by himself. But that wasn't the plan of God. The plan and the purpose of God was not for Joshua to take the land. It was for the nation to take the land. And here's a note for us. The leader could not go alone and fulfill God's calling. It began with Joshua. It began with the leader. But if the leader had gone by himself and not taken the people across, then he would not have fulfilled the plan and purpose of God in his life. Now Joshua would begin to push, God, Joshua would begin to lead, Joshua would begin to ask, Joshua would begin to encourage the people to move forward into the land of Canaan. But every single individual that was in Canaan was going to have to make up their own mind whether they were going to cross the Jordan or not. Every one of them. And we know that some of the tribes decided to stay on the far side of the Jordan. They said, we're not going to go take territory over there. And Joshua said, well, that's cool if you want to live on the other side, but you're going to come over here and fight for it because that's the promise of God. And you're going to fight for the promise of God anyway. But when we're done fighting, you can come back and live over here. And they decided to do exactly that. See, whenever you're all in, in your, with your family and all in with your business and all in with your career and, and all in with your faith, you're never going to just do it alone. You're always going to be taking people with you. There is a, a command, there is a, an unction, there is a, a push from the Holy Spirit that says you're not there all by yourself. The leader isn't the focus of the vision. The nation is the focus of the vision. So you're not intended to go into the promised land by yourself. Leading is never a solitary pursuit. And you might think, well, I am not a leader. Good thing. I'm glad you can talk to somebody else, Pastor. No, I'm talking to you. Because the moment that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you became a leader in this world. You became somebody, someone who had an understanding of what God could do and what God would do. You, you became one who understood that you were bought with a price and you were not your own. You, you became one who understood that God can take you out of sin and darkness and, 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 and the incomparable negatives of the world and take you into a place of light and, and generosity and love and, and peace and joy that goes beyond anything this world can offer. And he has never one time said, glad you're saved, now I'm going to take you to heaven. He said, glad you're saved, now find somebody else to bring with you. Our job is to never go alone. 
God's calling was to the nation. Now, now in that day, God's people was Israel. Today, God's people is his church. All of us, those who are believers in Christ Jesus. And as a senior pastor, as a pastoral team, as elders, as administrators, as staff, as the church, as individuals, we must not, we cannot, we will not, and we do not lead for ourselves. We lead to benefit others who have yet to enter into their promise. That's why we're here. That's the whole purpose beyond our calling. See, pride and selfishness says, well, no, no, I, 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 God saved me. And so I have something great to do. It's all about me. That's pride and selfishness. Pride and selfishness says, I'm going to do it my own way and do it on my own, but you can't do that. If you cross the Jordan but leave your family behind, you're not following the call of God. If you cross the Jordan but leave your business behind, you're not following the plan. If you cross the Jordan but you leave those behind that God has given you influence with, you're not following the plan of God. The plan and the purpose of God has never changed in His plan and His purpose has always been that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. Praise God. That's the calling and plan of God. So we as a church, we love God, we love each other, and we get the message out. We love God. Why? Because he first loved us. We, we, we love each other. Why? Because we're the family of God. We get the message out. Why? Because we are surrounded by people who need to meet the Savior. We lead people because we've stepped into the promised land of salvation. We lead people because we're opening up the promised land to our friends and to our family and to all who need Jesus. We, need, we lead because, we need, uh, because others rather need to cross the Jordan and enter into the land of promise. That's why we lead. We lead for all who have a destiny waiting to be entered into. We don't lead only for ourselves. But thank God we get to enjoy the blessing of the promised land too. What we're saying here is that we met one who made a difference in our lives and, and he can make a difference in your life too. What we're saying is come and go with me to my father's house. We used to sing an old song and I don't know if you sang it or not, but it says, come and go with me to my father's house. Ba-do-do-do to my father's house. To my father's house. I'm, look, I'm looking at faces and thinking you probably did not sing this song. <laughs> Come and go with me to my father's house. There is peace in my father's house. And then we'd say, there is joy in my father's house. And then we'd say everything else that came to our minds in our Father's house. And we could sing that song for about four hours. <laughs> There's a lot in the Father's house. That's what we're saying. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for his children. And his purpose has not changed. The children of God are not here for us. We are here for those who do not yet know him. And that brings us to thought number two that God requires that we shift from a reactive per, to a proactive attitude. From a reactive to a proactive attitude. To this point, Israel was always reactive. God moved, then they moved. God brought the plagues upon Egypt. Egypt said, hey, go, and then they moved. God opened the Red Sea, and then they walked across. God said, go to Sinai. They went to Sinai. God said, here's the law. They took the law. God said, now, cloud by day, pillar by night, it's going to move. And when it moves, you move. And they did. Constantly reacting. The enemy, an enemy would attack. They would say, God, what do we do? He would say, leave. Or he would say, fight. And then they would do. Constantly reacting to the world around them. 
But then they get to the Jordan River for the very first time and Moses says, hey, it's time for us to go across the river. And they go, hmm, mm, uh, it's time for you to go take the land. Ooh, uh, mm, maybe, uh, hmm, you sure? Uh, God says, wherever you put your foot, I, I'm asking you to go from a reactive to a proactive attitude. So he said, I'm going to give you the opportunity to make the difference. Wherever you put your foot, that's the land that you'll, you'll be able to take. I've already given it to you. He said, wherever you put your foot, you'll be on land that I've given you. But, but you've got to put your foot on it for you to be able to receive it. In reactive times, God gave directions. In proactive time, God gave parameters. Until this point, God said, I want you to go here, I want you to go here, camp in Kadesh Barnea, camp at the, by the mountain of Sinai, camp. He told them specifically where to go. Now look at what he says, Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have given you. From the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River to the, in the east, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. He's not moving them to a specific spot. He's saying within these parameters, it's all yours. Go get it. It's all yours. Take the whole land. And every move wasn't going to be dictated. Some of the decisions were theirs to be made themselves. So a, a reactive attitude maintains humble patience. A proactive attitude requires humble boldness. Both of them require humility. Humility that's willing to listen. Humility that's willing to say, I, I don't have it all together. Humility that's, that's willing to say, I don't even know how this is all going to end up necessarily. Humble patience waits. Humble boldness goes and gets it. So the whole land's given to the people, but they could possess only the portion that they were bold enough to claim. God made it available. God makes it available to your family. God makes it available to your business. God makes it available in faith to you. God makes it available to us as a church. But we have to have the boldness to make the difference in the situation. Humble patience waits for the situation to develop before walking in. But humble boldness changes the situation. He was saying to them, I want you to walk into the river. We'll talk about this a little bit next week, but the river was still flowing. And God says, I want you to go ahead and wade on into the river. Uh, aren't you supposed to part it first? And then we'll wade in. I want you to go approach Jericho. Hmm. Aren't you supposed to take them out first? And then we'll, no, he's saying, I want you to adopt a proactive posture here, a proactive attitude, and go make the difference in the situation. I'm giving you the opportunity. I'm giving you my promise that you will be successful. But you've got to go make it happen. I wonder what area of your life, is, is it in your family that you need to become proactive? Is it in your faith that you need to become proactive? How about your marriage, your business, or your career? Are you waiting for things to just open up before you so that you can assume that new level, that new opportunity? That... And could God be calling you to go and make the difference as he is guiding you and directing you through the Holy Spirit? What area of that is, is in your life? Here at McCord, we, we, God's positioned us to cross the Jordan River. We're uniquely positioned to, to take land. 15 acres on Mitchell, we're going we're gonna to close on that. But I want us to understand something. When we close on this property, we're not, we're not so concerned about 15 acres of land on Mitchell Road. I, I'm thankful for that. But that isn't the focus of the vision.
It's not about a building that could be built on there. A beautiful church, a beautiful sanctuary, a beautiful kids ministry area and student ministry. All of those things are good, but I want us to understand as a church, these will be tools that God has placed in our hands in order to be able to achieve the vision that he has for us. So what is the vision that he has for us? It is the souls of the men and women, the boys and the girls that will come to know Jesus from within the four walls of that that building. It will be those that we can reach out to from that particular space. It will be those that we serve from that particular location. The building can never be the focus of the vision or we've lost it entirely. It is a tool. What is the vision? The promise is for your children and for your grandchildren and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God shall call that's the vision that's the promise the land is symbolic the land is symbolic and we have to decide will be will we be bold and shift our attitude and our posture but the promise is more souls for the kingdom of God We want to take more territory from the enemy. That's the goal. And that brings us to thought number three this morning, that a decision to cross the line of no return occurs in every life. Every life. Till this point, Israel had done nothing that could not be returned to its original status. They were in the wilderness. They hadn't yet crossed the Jordan. They could, they could stay in the wilderness. They could go back to Kadesh Barnea and camp and be there for the rest of their lives. They could even go back to Egypt. They would have found that Egypt 40 years later was different than the Egypt they had left, but they could have gone back to Egypt. If they did so, they would have never experienced all that God had for them. They would not have seen what their nation could become. They would have not lived in the land of promise. They could stop short of fulfilling God's call and destiny for their lives. Or they could choose as a nation to follow the call of God, to follow Joshua across that river and go take new territory. We as a church right now, we have done nothing that could not be returned to its previous state. We could ask all of you who have come to become part of this church family over the last couple of years, we could just ask all of you to leave. We could. We're not. We could. We could decide not to close on the, the property on the 30th, uh, 18th. We, we could choose not to and just stay right here and do what we're doing right now. We could. If Pastor Andy's in town, he'll have either been at one of the services or will be at one of the services. He might be here right now. I can't really see you. We could ask him to come out of retirement and I could go into retirement. The first part of that's not that funny. The second part of that is hilarious. <laughs> we could go back to what has been. And I wish I could tell you that, that we could cross the Jordan, cross the Rubicon, if you will, a line that really can't be come back from. I wish I could say that we could change without changing but I can't. But what I see the Holy Spirit wanting to do through this body, through this church, the vision is not about Micah. Can I tell you, it would be far easier, far easier to pastor a far smaller church than this. And we're not talking about it getting easier, we're talking about it getting harder. When I hear 
about six of the Northview football team giving their life to Jesus Christ this week. When I hear about 40-something kids, I think it was, at Waite High School giving their life to Jesus Christ this week. When I think about all the people that we've been able to, to help over the years, when I, think about, when I think about the impact that this church has made in this community, when I think about, when I start thinking about the vision for the future, Maybe some things have changed that we can't go back. I don't know where you're at in your life right now. Maybe you're in your family or in, in your business or in your situation. You're, you're looking at a, 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 a line in the sand and you know, you know, may, maybe everybody thinks that you made this decision years ago. I know in Christy and I's world, when, when we got married, I, I thought that's a, that's a line in the sand. It's never going to be any different than this. And, and when I asked her to marry me, even further back than that, I thought that's never going to change. It's always going to be okay. And, and, and then five years into our marriage, we're looking at divorce. I thought that's a line we already crossed, but, but apparently it's not. And I remember working through all of those issues and all of those problems. And I remember the day that it clicked in my mind that it really doesn't matter what she says. It doesn't matter what she does. It doesn't matter how crazy I get. She and I are together and that's all. She's got to kill me or die to get rid of me. <laughs> and if I die suddenly, I want somebody to say something, okay? <laughs> We crossed the line somewhere. I don't know where you're at in your world. I don't know where you're at in your life right now, but I'm just, I'm just telling you in this room, there are men and women, there are boys and girls, there are people who you've got a line before you and the Holy Spirit's calling you to step over that line, go to that place of no return, go to that all-in place in your heart, in your spirit. It w go all in with your finances. Go all in with your faith. Go all in with every part of you. I'm not just talking about the church. I want you to do that too, and I believe God's calling us as a body. But if I went all by myself and you didn't come with us, I'd just be one very lonely person. God's got a vision for his people. God's got a vision for your family. He's got a vision for your business. He's got a vision for, you, vision for your community. And he's calling us to be all in on that. Because he's already all in on it himself. Would you bow your heads with me right now? Father, in the name of Jesus. Your presence is here in such a powerful way, and I'm grateful for it. I'm asking you right now, Lord, to give us holy and humble boldness. To step out in faith. To be proactive. I don't know who's fighting a battle. That if they would take the first step, the battle would win, be won. If they would be bold in this moment that the victory would come as you give it. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that we would be humble enough and boldness would sweep through this congregation, this family of faith. And with every head bowed and every eye closed in this room right now, if you know that God is calling you to make this shift, this shift to just be all in from maybe you've lived in humility, but it's been more of a, a humble patience. And you know it's time to step into humble boldness. Would you just slip up your hand real quick? Nobody looking around. I see hands all over this building. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for those that took that step of faith. I pray right now that you would allow a courage that's beyond human understanding to rise up within them. I pray that in their families, in their businesses, in their, in their careers, in their school, I, I pray, Lord, in their marriages, in their relationships, I pray in their faith, That a boldness that they've never known before would rise up within them. Holy Spirit, stir within their hearts. 
give them clarity to be able to see the next step to take. Maybe they can't know the whole story, but you can give them the next step. And I ask you to do that today. Let them walk in your presence and let them take this land of promise in Jesus' name. And can everybody say amen?